Ah, welcome back yet again to Behind the Bastards, a podcast about G. Gordon Liddy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we uh, we initially did four parts, and I was like, that's probably about as much G. Gordon Liddy. I, I had hoped to cover his whole life in full par- four parts, and I just, I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop getting into these little rabbit holes, kept getting pulled into things. He's just too interesting. And I'm always, you know, whenever we have an episode that runs into the multi parts, I get kind of anxious because I'm afraid that like, you know, every, no episode is everybody's favorite. Right. And so we, we try to <laughs> we try to have variety. We try to go back and forth between, you know, we got cult leaders, business monsters, Nazis, you know, quack doctors, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so everybody gets some of what they like. Uh, so I, I get worried whenever we start going too long on one guy. But I, I, I listened to the first four episodes and I, I kept feeling like we were we were doing a disservice to the audience by not finishing the G. Gordon Liddy story. You know, I I will admit it did feel like there was like plenty more to do. There's so and, much and more. I, I think to your to your point, you know, it, it does. He does cover he, he's like a, a real like uh, multi hyphenate in terms. of Yeah. Fucking yeah true true fuck faces of and, the 20th century and we're we're missing still you know watergate is quite a thing and his just his his fascinating brain is worth studying but we're missing a whole chunk of his career which is where he kind of invents the modern concept of a right wing influencer in a lot of ways yeah. so andrew uh welcome back to the show um what up now Folks, you you may have noticed the absence of a of a certain voice in the audience today. <laughs> uh, Sophie is not here. Uh, she was taken into custody by Nicaraguan <laughs> authorities after a brief gun battle last weekend. She's fine. Uh, we're working on 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 getting her out. Uh, you know, it's just a misunderstanding to do with some. It's just some paperwork that needs to be filed. <laughs> yeah, sure. Nothing yes, major. Paper, paperwork, paperwork. Yes, that's it. That's right. Sorry, Ian. Yes, paperwork, not kidnappings. So, Ian, uh, Ian Johnson, our uh, our inimitable editor, is uh, is is sitting in for her today. How are you doing, Ian? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, excited to learn more about the G-Man. You know, oh, he's boy. burning himself, lighting <laughs> yes, his hands yes. on fire. <laughs> yes, I love it. So yeah, let's I, keep it coming. You know, I'm kind of low key glad uh, that that Sophie wound up trying to overthrow the Nicaraguan government last weekend because yeah. this is an episode that does need a little bit of a boys' club because we're going to not just be talking about G. Gordon Liddy, but a lot of concepts of masculinity in our society. Um, that mm. I think he kind of embodies pretty well. So this will be good. This will be a good good time for the bro squad. Okay, we're gonna bro down. down. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. We're gonna bro down hard, everybody. Just uh, guys I, being dudes. Just just, just guys dudes being, being fellas. Guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, Ian, when when I was trying to come up with ways to introduce this show last night, I, I was thinking up nicknames for you in my head since I, I haven't gotten to do that much. Like okay, I do I'd love to hear these. Well, <laughs> I was gonna go with Ebow the letter which is a, a reference to an R.E.M. song about River Phoenix that that like four people know uh, today. All of the people who, who listened to that song back in the 90s are dead now, except for like me and I'm going to guess Dan Aykroyd. He was one of River Phoenix's friends, and right? No, maybe one of the guys in R.E.M. or they yeah. don't even know it anymore. No, no, no. There's no way Michael Stipe remembers this. Not with all of the yeah. Michael Stipe induced brain damage he has. <laughs> um, <laughs> are we are we ready for the last of Liddy? Yes. Oh, my let's God. Do it. Okay. 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 When we left off with the G man, he had just been convicted um, and sentenced to like 20 years in prison for his many crimes, many incompetent crimes. Now, obviously, Liddy does not do close to 20 years in prison, but he and his family don't know that where he goes inside. And to all, for everything I can tell, I believe he was fully willing to serve that amount of time, right? One thing you can't take away from the guy is his commitment to the bit. And the bit, of course, is fascism. So I don't really respect it, but I, I do respect the commitment, you know? Yeah. You, you just kind of have to past a certain point. Look, I'm worried that I have said, made this analogy or repeated this analogy before on this very show, mm-hmm. but it's a little bit the same as like 
the like 9-11 hijackers. Mm-hmm. Everyone constantly calls them calls those attacks cowardly. Absolutely not. <laughs> and the one thing they absolutely were not is no. cowardly. Look, they weren't they were, it wasn't a good thing to do, but it was not cowardly. <laughs> yeah. It was very brave. <laughs> yeah. Well that I think this go- goes into actually something that's very relevant to these episodes, which is that our, our culture places a moral value on concepts like courage. And courage, physical yeah. courage is an absolutely amoral value. The, the SS, a lot of guys with physical courage in the SS, yeah. doesn't matter, doesn't make them good, is not like a redeeming trait. It's and it's the so, same thing, yeah. you know, when I say something is respectable, respect does not imply morality. It's like if somebody is incredibly good at breaking and entering into houses in order to like take people's valuables, that may not be a good thing. He's probably hurting a lot of people, but you have to respect the degree of skill in busting through a lock, you know? Yeah. Um, also, that one isn't as ambiguous, unambiguously bad. As no, it's not. I don't know. You know, look, we've been a breaking and entering. It's all where it goes. A little bit of B and E. Yeah, I guess it depends <laughs> on the B and the E. Yeah. Um. So back to Liddy. So he he goes inside and his his wife takes a job. I think she's a sixth grade teacher um, and is completely the one taking care of the family while he is out. I, she has some help from Gordon's parents, but his father, Sylvester, is going to die about halfway through his his time in prison, um, which I think seriously reduces the ability of uh, the in-laws to kind of take care of them. This also means that Liddy is going to be left without the, let's say, questionable moral support that his dad was able to. That was like the one thing holding him back, though, right? (laughs) I think if his dad had been alive, he probably would have given his dad a copy of the autobiography before it went published. And his dad would have been like, you got to de-Hitler this thing by about 50%. (laughs) <laughs> Everyone needs that person in your life yeah. to just say, just a less Hitler, less yeah. Hitler. I know we all want to Hitler a ton. Yeah. Count up the Hitler references in your book. Cut them in half. You know what? Cut them in half. Half, half as much Hitler. Fair yeah. enough. It's so, like Coco Chanel for Coco Chanel and Coco yeah. Chanel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, you just, just the Chanel, leave the Coco out. I think the problems are in the Coco. So- Liddy's lawyer during this period is a guy named Peter Maroulis. And and if you comb through old New York Times articles or other contemporary Watergate coverage, you'll see Maroulis mentioned a lot. Uh, he had a reputation for being mild mannered but persistent. He was apparently pretty good looking. Uh, it's hard to judge his actual competence from this case because Liddy doesn't really give him a chance to be a great defense lawyer, right? Liddy is like, I am guilty and I will say nothing else, which is, to be fair to Peter, a difficult position to be in as a defense attorney. You don't have a lot of wiggle room there. It is really funny the way in which the G-man describes his four, because Maroulis is his former law partner and his best friend, quote, A tall, powerfully built man with a Clark Kent face and glasses under thinning sandy hair, Peter Maroulis will correct anyone who refers to his ethnic extraction as Greek by advising sternly that he is a Spartan. He was my best friend. Oh, my God. Uh, I I wasn't sure we were going to get a Sparta reference in here, but there we go. There we go. We got it. We, We did it, everyone. It's it's good to know. And this probably goes back uh, literally as to Herodotus. People who call themselves a Spartan are the fucking worst. Oh, yeah. Anyone who because like they weren't good at like their period of time as like it like objectively dominant in in the, the Greek peninsula was like roughly the period of time Martin Scorsese has been making movies, right? Like it's not it's not like that long a span of time. And I, I think Scorsese is more impressive as like a, a force <laughs> in culture. But Maroulis is not a Spartan, of course. Uh, he is from Poughkeepsie, which is the opposite of Sparta, I think. Um, probably in a good way, uh, but whatever. When he first went away, when Liddy first goes away, gets locked up, he's sent in a local jail, kind of as his case is winding its way to completion. He gets a period where he's like, he's convicted, but he's not like permanently sentenced and everything. Hey everyone, Robert here. I actually got this wrong. Uh, I double checked and Sparta's period of military dominance in Greece was something like was a little over 30 years, whereas Corsese has been directing for like 50 something years. Uh, it would have been better if I had compared the length of time that Sparta was the dominant military power in Greece to like the run of the Simpsons at present, um, although they'll beat it soon. And he describes himself during this early period of incarceration as totally at peace, um, because while he had abandoned his family and left his wife to fend for their five children completely alone, uh, it was all in service of a greater cause. And that greater cause was Richard Nixon. Now, 
Liddy was not unaware of the fact this is an unfair thing to do to your wife, right? To abandon her for half a decade in order to protect Dick Nixon. The the man least deserving of loyalty of anyone who has ever lived. But yeah, at one point, it, it, he seems to have been somewhat aware, dimly at least, that this was not a morally clean thing for him to be doing. And so at one point, this is what's one of the things that's interesting about him. At one point, he sits down with her on a visitation day and is like, look, I know this is not what you signed up for. This is not fair. If you want to leave me, get a divorce, find someone new, you know, that's totally fine with me. I'll, I'll sign the papers. I'll do whatever. And Fran opts to stick by him, uh, which is, I guess, at least proof that even the sickest weirdos on this planet can find true love. Um, I don't know what I you want to like interpret from that. I don't find it optimistic, but it is a thing. In a weird oh, way, yeah. it's pretty sweet. It it's is like very twisted, that's, but it's sweet. Yeah. It's a yeah. deeply sweet thing to do. Again, I hate that this incredible gesture of love is on behalf of Richard Nixon. <laughs> or at least partly so. Like, that's not great, but yeah. it is what it is. It is. So uh, Gordon does not describe his experience in prison as bad. Um, he does, however, describe it like a white guy raised on Clint Eastwood movies from the 70s, right? <laughs> this is like, I, I don't know the degree to which, I, th I know that th he's not telling the full truth. I suspect he is censoring his true feelings about his time behind bars significantly and consciously aping movies from the 1970s in this book that he writes because he, he knows that that'll sell with conservatives, right? There's a lot of dirty Harry in, in a number of chunks of this book. Um, <laughs> here's one line where he talks about his early days in jail. In here, people were all neighbors and it was like old home week. I couldn't understand most of what was being said. It was all in black dialect and I didn't speak it. I have since of necessity <laughs> become fluent. <laughs> I don't I don't think that's the case because he he writes and I'm not going to I'm not going to read him writing what he calls black dialect, but he does attempt to at several times and I I do not find him credible. I'll say that. Yeah. This is this is some real I speak jive. It is Did this it, it, come up before airplane. I it, I actually don't know that. I'm not exactly sure when that movie came out. It's pretty embarrassing to read. I, again, I'm not going to like go too much into it because of how embarrassing it is. But you should know that this is not just not just a thing he does once, but a thing that is like repeatedly a part of this chunk of his narrative. So because Liddy and McCord and Hunt all got caught and charged so far ahead of the bulk of the Watergate scandal breaking out, there's this long lag time. And this is one of the things that the um, the two different TV shows we've talked about really fuck up. I mean, I don't think they fuck it up. I think it's a narrative choice they make. But they really mess with the timeline for the purposes of making it seem like guys like John Dean and, and Ehrlichman and whatnot getting in trouble times up with the break in and with uh, guys like uh, Hunt and Liddy getting in trouble much better than it does. In reality, the shit with Hunt and Liddy happens well ahead of the rest of the scandal breaking. Um, and so these guys are all kind of in jail while the Nixon administration is falling apart. Liddy is determined to prevent this, to prevent Nixon from getting forced out of office. Again, the whole thing that was kind of like keeping him together was the idea that by sacrificing himself and his family, he could keep Nixon in office. That like the chain of, of custody would stop with him and that Nixon wouldn't get in trouble if, if he went away. And he kind of comes to the conclusion that if McCord or Hunt in particular break, that's such a danger to the administration that he would have to murder them, you know? So he claims that, you know, he, he, he says that he makes, because he claims he's very popular with, with some of these other prison guys. Um, and he claims that one of these dudes, and he always tells you that he, these are black men, um, tells him <laughs> that the price of a murder is two cartons of cigarettes. Um, he works out uh, like the, a plan, basically, where he'll assault a guard to get sent to solitary for a few days. And then this friend of his, who's totally his buddy, will murder whichever one of his co-conspirators that he needed dead. Knowing Liddy, knowing his general level of competence, I wouldn't be surprised if he got a dude to say, yeah, man, give me cigarettes and I'll totally murder a dude with you. Send yourself <laughs> to solitary and I'll make it happen, right? Like, I, I, I would not be surprised if someone scammed him. Um, as a spoiler, he never comes close to hurting anyone in prison that we can prove in any way, shape, or form. I think a lot of this is just bluster and this dude having watched a lot of prison movies. Um, you really, look, I just back of the envelope a little bit of even with inflation, 
how the fuck are you going to try to get away with two cartons of cigarettes is the price. Like, get yeah. the fuck out of here. <laughs> I, I think the idea is that, like, well, if you're if you're a lifer or whatever, it doesn't really matter either way. You'd rather have the cigarettes or whatever. But, like, I think they're going to take your cigarettes, right? Like, if you murder a guy, they're going to throw you in solitaire. I don't know. It doesn't seem yeah. that, 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 especially since... We're talking about like very high profile prisoners. Like, yeah, it's, it's one thing if it's like, yeah, if you murder this other dude who's a lifer and who nobody on the outside cares about and you could probably get away with it because the prison authorities aren't going to investigate. If, if you murder <laughs> E. Howard Hunt, like, yeah, they're not just going to pretend that didn't happen, you know? But also people know what kind of money you have access to and what yes. you're trying to do. You don't yeah. think the price is going to be. 100k yeah. to my family on yeah, the you, outside you don't think anyone's going to like foia to see like hey this guy <laughs> got murdered right after g gordon liddy gets put in solitary did he buy anything for another prisoner right beforehand <laughs> like is that documented like every journalist in the country would have poured over this so anyway yeah. whatever but again liddy never does anything uh gordon claims that during the start of his time in prison he is because he's a white man in a jail uh the subject of numerous racial epithets during the start of his time behind <laughs> bars um he says his new neighbors were particularly angry because and this is his fault. He would walk naked to and from the shower, which he thought was fine because of his experiences in high school gym. But like, it's apparently rude in a prison. Now, again, prison mores change regularly and are, differ from region to region. But this seems like a pretty easy thing to know if it's like getting a bad reaction to people. Just don't yeah. walk naked around it. Put a towel on, man. Like, it's not that hard. <laughs> anyway, his decision is not to just put a towel on. He says that after a week or so, being basically being called honky, he decides to fight back. And I'm going to give you one guess as to how he decides to fight back against anti-white racism. <laughs> what he describes is that. Did he light himself oh. on fire? No. Oh, that was the other likely. No, Ian. No, it's Nazi. It's Nazi stuff. Yeah. He does a Nazi again. He's got one play he has, and he loves the play. No, Ian's right. He's got two. He has bringing up the SS and lighting himself on fire. Like mm -hmm. those are the only two plays he ever developed. Well, at that point, that was also the King Nazi move. Yeah. Yeah. Light yourself, <laughs> on, yourself fire. on fire. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That's what Hitler did to the whole country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, quote, I seethed, then an idea, he seethed after getting, you know, yelled at. Yeah. Uh, then an idea hit me. They wanted race. I'd give them race. My mind reached back 35 years deep into my childhood. In my head, the shortwave of my mother's old Emerson snapped on. The music started and I started to sing, sing as I hadn't in years. I roared out into the chaos about me, the anthem of the nation whose psychotic obsession with race sent millions of those believed inferior to their graves. And then he starts singing the horse whistle lied. <laughs> Oh my God! By the even, time, <laughs> even as far as Nazi shit you could do in prison, that is impressively yeah. bonkers. And he's like, there was something so powerful about the music that they all stopped yelling at me as soon as they heard it, even though they didn't speak German. And it's like, no, they look. I'm gonna, yeah, of course, I'm gonna guess most people in the DC jail did not speak German, but like. They knew this was Nazi shit. They knew, like, it does, it's not that hard. When a guy starts singing a Marshall German song, you get what's going on yeah. in a jail. Yeah. Like, so this is where I, I, I yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty fun. So after some time in the DC jail, he gets sent to a larger facility, Danbury. Um, and he's, he's still kept out. He's in a bigger facility now, but he's kept out of the general population because he still hasn't been sentenced. He claims that during this time, he met another Nazi, the son of the SS Gestapo commander of Brussels, who became his chess partner. He's like, yeah, mm -hmm. I met the son of this uh, SS Gestapo commander in Brussels. Uh, and, and we started becoming like, uh, you know, chess buddies. Quote, yeah. we get on famously. He knows more songs than I do. And shower time sounds like the invasion of Poland. Oh, my God. That's a sentence you should not ever write. Now, Just these two naked Nazis <laughs> belting out fucking Wagner in the Yeah. First <laughs> off, comparing your shower time to the invasion of Poland, let me remind you all, three million Jewish Poles are murdered during the Nazi occupation, along with at least 1.8 million non-Jewish Polish citizens. That's a little bit political, right? Like the Polish state will say it's about three million Polish citizens. Honestly, that doesn't really sound impossible to me. Like a lot, sure. so many Polish people 
die as a result of the occupation. More importantly, though, we can actually drill into the accuracy of this claim. His claim that he was buddies with the uh, the son of the SS Gestapo commander in Brussels. Because that's a job. We know who did that gig, right? The head of this Gestapo in Belgium was a dude named Constantine Canaris. Now, you, you may have heard of um, a guy named Admiral Wilhelm Canaris. Canaris was a Nazi who was one of the guys that was p- kind of part of the plot against Hitler that's in that um that uh, that oh, Tom yeah. Cruise movie. Mm-hmm. He gets a little rehabilitated for this. That should not be the case. Wilhelm Canaris is like not one of the worst Nazis, but was definitely Definitely a Nazi. Yeah. He worked very closely with Reinhard Heydrich, architect of the Holocaust. Um, he's one of these dudes who doesn't like Hitler at the end because he thinks Hitler's losing the war. And he gets executed, by the way, should have been executed and was fucking executed. His nephew is a Konstantin Canaris, who is the head of the Gestapo in Brussels during when Brussels is occupied by the Nazis. Constantine is also a fucking war criminal. He gets sentenced to 20 years hard labor for a number of things. He's responsible for the execution of a number of political prisoners. He's also, he plays a significant role in the roundup and deportation of Belgian Jews. He is one of the guys who helps do the Holocaust, right? Constantine Canaris. Obviously, he's the Gestapo head in in Belgium. He's not a good person. Constantine serves half of his sentence uh, and then dies in 1983, which is three years after Liddy's book was published. I have a little trouble nailing this down entirely, but his German Wikipedia entry says that he has multiple sons, but it only names two of them. And of the sons that I know he had, neither of them ever spent any time in a U.S. prison. Klaus Wilhelm was a legal scholar and a professor who spent his entire life living and working in Germany. Volker Canaris uh, became a director and produced a famous movie about the Commandant of Auschwitz. Um, He also spent his life in Germany. I can find absolutely no evidence that uh, that that Constantine Canaris had a son who went to the United States and was put in a D.C. area jail or prison. Um, no evidence whatsoever that this happened. Uh, I believe, based on what I can confirm, that G. Gordon Liddy is lying about this or that some random dude lied yeah. to him about being this guy's son. You know, yeah, Either I think I mean, happen. it's it feels like at this point it's, you know, hey, the guy that was singing fucking Nazi songs in the other prison before it got transferred over. I'll just tell him as a regular ass American mm-hmm. Nazi that I'm a special Nazi. Yeah. That I'm Constantine Canaris's son. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Again, he's lying here or, or I think that like there's a pretty good chance that Liddy is lying because he does lie regularly in his memoir. And I, I hope that keeps in your head as we investigate the wackier claims he makes on his journey. Anyway, Moving on, Liddy says that due to his familiarity with FBI studies on interrogation, he knew that the ideal time to interrogate and break a person who has been locked up is after six weeks, that the FBI likes to leave people in custody for uh, about six weeks because there's this kind of initial period you get when you move into incarceration where you get like extra resilient and like kind of tough and like I can take this, I'm going to, and that after about six weeks, the kind of natural boost you get from that wears down and you're at the lowest point in your psychological defenses. So he figured that they were going to wait until he'd been in there a couple of months and then they were going to try to break him, right, and get him to talk because that's when he would be at his most vulnerable. So he decides that he has to build up his willpower to fight back. And the first move he takes to do this is to become, honestly, you know, I hope, you know, if you've got an eating disorder, we're going to talk about that a bit here. He decides to cut his food intake to 600 calories a day and starve himself while doubling his daily exercise routine. And like he describes this as a, a mental exercise to increase his willpower. As someone who has had an eating disorder, this all reads to me like a guy describing his descent into anorexic mania in order to have more control over his situation after being locked up. Like right. that, that is how this reads to me. And I'm going to I'm going to read you a segment from that quote. My mood remained steady. I was getting along with all the other prisoners. Things were going very well, too well. I decided I needed more stress to bring my will to maximum power. I told <laughs> turned to my old reliable method of ordeal by fire. This test would have to exceed all others in destruction of tissue and time of severe pain. I selected a particularly strong willed black bank robber named Tex with whom to engage in a battle of wills ready with a box of wooden matches. I got him into a discussion of the subject and pressed him to the point where he expressed disbelief and challenged me because I had been warned never 
never again to indulge in that practice near or on finger joints, and my palm was already burned out. Jesus Christ, Gordon. I had to go back to where I started years before, my forearm. The scars there were light. Strike a match, I said to Tex, and locked my eyes onto his. He struck it and held it out, not knowing what to do next. I put the unburned outside of my left forearm directly over the flame. As the fire burned through my flesh and melted it back into a blackened depression, a look of horror came over Tex, but he stayed with it. The match burned down and scorched his fingers before he dropped it. I grinned at him as he looked at the burn unbelievingly, then looked ill, got up, and left. I I know this is somewhat your uh, excerpting of this book, but it is a little telling that I I feel like over about four some hours now, the only moments of human intimacy he seems to have is while he's burning himself. (laughs) While he's lighting himself on fire? Yes. (laughs) Yeah. It's really shocking. This is both the kind of anarchy. Well, I'm going to starve myself to 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 damage my body by by starving myself. And I am going to engage in these kind of self like this is the same as cutting i think yeah like, i think there's a lot of that going on here he has to frame it as this like this is willpower i mean or you know it's like in as clearly this is a very like mm-hmm. you know this autobiography is unedited essentially this is yeah. clearly what he's telling himself so like this is what he he has to believe about it right but yeah. like this is also something he pretty consistently goes back to in times of like stress and anxiety. Speaking of self harm, you know what's <laughs> and human intimacy and human intimacy. You know what's fundamentally well, I don't know. Self harm is much more complicated than that. But what's not complicated is these ads. Oh, ho, ho, we're back. We're back and we're talking about G. Gordon Liddy, who, you know, I will say this. I bet one of the things that will stop people from fucking with you in jail is lighting yourself on fire while staring at them. That does seem like an effective way to make someone be like, this guy's not worth it. <laughs> like, that's that is the weird thing is it's like like he has he has this desire to cultivate this like I survived prison tough mm-hmm. guy shit. And the shit that he's actually doing, he just like it's it's so weird what he chooses to frame in which way. Yeah. Cause he could just be like, this was how I chose yeah. to if he had written like these, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to scare people, so I lit my I permanently yeah. damaged my my skin without breaking eye contact because I thought the and like I, I would believe that. I would be like, Yeah, man, that does sound like yeah. something. It does sound yeah. like people would probably give you a I would. give you a little bit of space. Yeah. <laughs> um Liddy also tells several stories of fights that he got in, and I don't really believe. Uh, yeah, I, I I will say I believe he got in some fights because most people who spend years in prison wind up having an altercation or, or to it, very least, right? Yeah. Um, these are never particularly glorious stories. He tries to punch them up. Like there's one where somebody steals something and so he has to go and like fight that guy so that other people weren't mess with him. And he describes it as like a fair fight, but he gets cut up horribly because this dude has a, a fighting ring, which is a, a cheap ring with the stone removed that will cut an opponent if you punch them with it. And so he goes into loving detail about how he like talks his way into buying a fighting ring. He spends like a a meaningful amount of time telling us about how he gets this fighting ring for himself, but he never uses it. Like yeah. he talks a lot about all the weapons he acquires in prison and he doesn't, he doesn't ever do anything with them. He just, Once needs again, you, again, he needs you to know he has them. Knife catalog guy. Knife cat. Very, very strong knife catalog guy energy. Yeah. yeah. Th- this Ooh. dude has a knife shaped like an Eagle with an American flag. printed <laughs> on the blade. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so while his skill at letting himself be severely burned for no reason convinced Liddy that his will was inviolate, E. Howard Hunt is not doing so well, right? Hunt is notably less satisfied spending the rest of his life behind bars. He's got several kids and, you know, Hunt, you'll know this at least if you watched uh, the White House Plumber Show, his wife dies in a mysterious plane crash, like while she's taking money in between a number of these Watergate convicted guys. It's very shady. You know, Hunt kind of made some statements about having knowledge of the JFK thing. It's all a messy story. Hunt's also a famous liar and fabulous, so I don't know how much you want to read into that. But he is in a bad position here, right? And he starts to unravel pretty soon after they all go behind bars. 
Now, Gordon becomes convinced that Hunt's betrayal would destroy his beloved Nixon, so he starts preparing to carry out an assassination against his old friend. Because Liddy is starving and deranged by this point, he starts looking for <laughs> hidden messages in his limited communications with the Nixon people, and mostly in newspaper articles. He's sure that the Nixon campaign is going to send him a message to kill E. Howard Hunt via, like, statements made to the papers and shit. Yeah. So... He sits down with his friend, this gangland figure, who told him that you can kill a guy with the price of two cartons of cigarettes. (laughs) He tells the dude, Nixon hasn't told me through, like, the fucking Washington Post to murder E. Howard Hunt yet, but it's surely coming. Yeah, let's... Get it on the schedule. Yeah, let's get it on the schedule. (laughs) Quote, that precaution out of the way, we decided quickly upon the method. Hunt received special meals because of his history of ulcers. In the parlance of the D.C. jail, it was a diet tray. It was served to him in his cell rather than in the CB4 mess hall on the first floor. Should I be ordered to kill Hunt, he would be served a special meal indeed. It would contain a lethal poison. (laughs) I believe this is, it's like nicotine, right? They're going to like, because you can, if you have cigarettes, you could like basically concentrate the nicotine oil and pure nicotine oh. it's pretty easy to kill someone with that's oh, his man. his plan again i don't actually know that he knew anybody who had the capacity to do that yeah this is more bluster for the book the reality is that hunt told liddy like what actually happens he talks a lot about how ready he was to kill this guy all the plans he had what really happens is hunt tells liddy hey man fuck nixon i'm going to i'm going to rat you know i'm going to rat for a better deal <laughs> Uh, and Liddy pouts and refuses to ever talk to him again. But he doesn't do anything <laughs> else. Nothing happens. Like, <laughs> again, all hat, no fucking cattle is, yeah, is the real. way to summarize this guy's whole life. The most important thing to know about Liddy's time behind bars is that it served as a surrogate combat experience for him. That's why he's so dedicated to this, right? He never gets to go to Korea. He never gets to fight anybody. He never gets to kill anybody. But he has this public chance where all he has to do is sit and be quiet And he will build the reputation he's always wanted as a hard, dangerous, tough man, right? It's it's really, it's quite easy. His wife has to go through hell, right? His kids have to go through hell. All he has to do is sit quietly in a room for several years. And then he gets this thing that means more than anything to him, proof that he's a hero, right? That's all he has to do. So this is really, in a lot of ways, the fact that he gets caught and charged for Watergate is the best thing that ever happens to him. Right. Yeah. Like it this really is, is what like gives a, him what a, he wants. A psychological twist in that, yeah. like, yeah, this is definitely yeah. the best shit that's ever happened to him. There's this. Um. There's this. Do you guys ever? Any you guys ever listen to the band Dawes? Nope. Not familiar. Yeah, it's a. I don't know. Kind of a folk bluegrassy. Yeah. Outfit. Um. They got a song called "When My Time Comes" that I think there's a line in it that really well sums up kind of the young male attitude about bravery, the attitude about like courage and heroism that you have as a kid, like as a dumb kid, that I, I think leads a lot of people to like, you know, joining the military and stuff like that. It, it inspires a lot of actually some of our uh, our worst behavior. There were moments of dreams I was offered to save. I lived less like a workhorse, more like a slave. I thought that one quick moment that was noble or brave would be worth the most of my life. This thing that like, and what's going on, what they're talking about here is this like, this realization you get as, as an adult, how complicated and difficult and messy and gray the world is and how nice it is to feel like you can do just one thing. Yeah. If it's the right thing at the right time, and then you've you've succeeded at being a person, right? Like, even if you die doing it, at least you don't have to think anymore. Like, and and the reality is that like doing good is is hard and complicated. And like what his wife does, what Liddy's wife does, is by every measure much more impressive, right? Yeah. Like it's it's not fancy. It doesn't get you a, a career as a media influencer, but like committing to care for children for four and a half years alone, five kids, is so much more braver than sitting yeah. in a cell alone, right? <laughs> like, well, I think I think it's like the, the like the need a shortcut silver bullet, like shoot the mm-hmm. moon of having a worthwhile life. Like these yeah. fucking clouds or not even clouds. Lots of people feel despair. Yeah. And it's just like, well, this thing will make me a person. Mm-hmm. This will do it. Just get the lottery. Just get the right like meaning of life lottery ticket. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. And he's gotten his lottery ticket. So that's I do believe to an extent that he's he's got morale behind him in this because he's he's getting everything he wants from it. 
So uh, I do suspect that eventually, though, like like with anyone, like just being locked up, being behind bars, being in this situation, he does start to grow deranged. And some of this is probably because he's starving himself, which is right. not great for your mental health. And Liddy doesn't have the self-awareness to recognize this, but you see pieces of it um, in stories he tells. Uh, probably the best one that best embodies this is he, he tells one story of a time when he's out, he's jogging in the yard, they've got rec time, so they're kind of outside. He's doing laps. And he sees a dead rat on the ground, right? This huge, nasty, (laughs) decomposing dead rat. And he becomes instantly convinced that there's another prisoner who's like kind of sitting nearby and that this guy picked up the rat from somewhere else and put it down where Liddy would see it to fuck with him, which is (laughs) insane. Like it is a prison. There's rats. Rats die. There's no reason for him to think that another prisoner stuck the rat there. And also it's like, So he just placed the rat kind of vaguely near a chunk of the running path that you might pass. Like, that doesn't seem likely, G. Gordon Liddy. That doesn't really seem like a taunt, even. What from, like, putting yourself in their shoes, like, what the fuck was the plan, dog? So he gets so angry at this that he he steps on the rotting rat to squish it and like mash it up. And he picks up this like rancid, decomposing, (laughs) fetid carcass and he walks over to the guy with it and he's like, here's your rat. And the guy's like, what the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) I'm just trying to get some, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, the guard did it, you're saying. And the guy guy is again like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, man. (laughs) Like. It is, again, even from Liddy's prose, it's very clear that everyone else is like, oh, this guy's fucking lost it. Yeah. And telling this story after the fact is what? I mean, yeah, Yeah, that's something you keep to yourself. I think (laughs) that is that's something you never tell anybody. Yeah. Maybe if you're like having an emotional conversation with your loved ones afterwards to tell them how bad it got. Anyway, whatever. (laughs) Um, Liddy is also peculiar in his time behind bars because he is not just an unrepentant fascist. He's also a lawyer and he he does care to an extent about the letter of the law. Even though he's always, even behind bars, a strong supporter of mass incarceration, he's livid every time his fellow inmates have their rights abused because he knows what the jails and prisons are supposed to provide and he knows when they're falling short and he can't stand for it. And so he becomes a jailhouse lawyer for everyone inside. And and from everything I've read, he really does quite a lot. He helps a number of these guys. This is probably Probably more than anything, why he doesn't get fucked with much, because like he really does provide a service after a while to a lot of dudes. You know, he helps them work through their cases. He gives them advice on how to appear in court. He helps them file motions and stuff to get things that they need. Um, He makes complaints like on behalf of this, there's this Jewish prisoner who's not getting kosher meals. He like gets forces the prison to give this guy kosher meals. Um, He develops feuds with a couple of different prison officials. He's in like eight different facilities. And I think his reasons are genuine. Some of these prisons, like people get killed doing dangerous work and he's angry about that the food is not of sufficient quality stuff like um faucets and shit in prison facilities aren't being maintained and he understands who to send letters to what kind of letters to send who to threaten in order to force the system to take action and i i think he's actually quite good at this and it's evidence that like again had he been a better person a guy yeah. like Liddy with these skills could have helped a lot of people in his life you know? It's like so close and it's so telling that his own autobiography doesn't see what could be good about him and what could be redeeming about him. I, I think he's so sees, weird. Yeah, he sees this as good because it's bad for the system not to be consistent. I don't think he sees this as good because these people deserve anything. <laughs> right. But you know, maybe I'm being too negative. Uh Probably the height of this behavior is when Gordon and more than 500 fellow inmates, he, he basically helps forces like a hunger strike at a facility he's at. Um, he he gets 500 fellow inmates to refuse to eat food for several days. Um, it's the longest of three strikes at that facility that year, and Liddy's leadership seems to be why. Um, the prison officials are so frustrated with him that he gets transferred to a maximum security facility afterwards. Um, this is like when he's at a minimum security place. Uh, He does spend a period of his bid uh, behind bars in California because he, you know, you remember he broke into that psychiatrist's office, Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist. So at a point in time, he gets like sent over to California because you got to do some time there because some of your crimes are over there. 
Um, he claims that by this point, he was famous in the prison system and he gets gifted with treats by his new neighbors when he arrives. I don't disbelieve that necessarily. Number one, yeah. he's probably got a good reputation. He helps people. He's also famous. So like, yeah, you know, just straight up. <laughs> yeah, just straight yeah. up. Like fame gets you places, right? But then he goes into what is definitely a lie. He tells an elaborate story about how one of the fellow inmates in California is a Kung Fu master who just Hell happened yeah. to be locked up too. Um, and this guy is from like, you know, he's this guy is from China. He's like traveled to the U S under mysterious circumstances, but then he gets locked up and like, we become friends. And Liddy God. writes one of the most embarrassing paragraphs I've ever read in my life. <laughs> we worked out at the weights together, and finally I decided it might be mutually advantageous to exchange instruction. He hesitated, then took me aside and told me that he had never imparted such knowledge to an occidental, and Hell despite yeah. our friendship, was not sure he ever should. He paused and studied me quietly. Finally, he spoke. You are a very violent man. I can see it in your eyes. I control it. Liddy said. <laughs> you must. If you ever use what I teach you to take advantage of the weak, I'll find you wherever you are and kill you myself. <laughs> of all the things that have never happened, this is the thing that's least happened in the history of things that didn't happen. Oh my happen. god. It's like a cut scene from Mortal Kombat. Oh, it fuck, is, get the that fuck is out of here. Embarrassing. <laughs> that is embarrassing, G. Gordon Liddy. Under, no way did any of this... now. It's not impossible that he just met a Chinese American man who got locked up and was like, yeah, I'll lie to this guy. Like, what yeah, else yeah. am I going to do? Prison's boring, right? <laughs> who believe anything I say? <laughs> um, not a 0% chance. Um, also, I love the like, you're a very violent man. No yeah. evidence that G. Gordon Liddy successfully did violence on anyone in his entire life. <laughs> yeah. Like, not one piece of evidence for this. <laughs> um, God, it's so funny. I can God, what see a, what it. What a sad thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of sad, you know what isn't sad? The value <laughs> that our sponsors bring to our listeners' lives. In fact, I don't know, Ian, would you say that our listeners' lives actually have no value whatsoever if they don't purchase the products that sponsor our show? I think legally I have to say yes. Yeah, yeah. I think you do. I based on based on the contract you had to sign to get healthcare. Yeah. Um anyway. Here's a uh, here's ads. Oh, what a good time! Feeling good, feeling fine. How's everybody else? Great, this is great. amazing. This uh -huh. is like one of the funniest things I've heard all week. So this <laughs> <Yeah>. is great. <laughs> good, good stuff. So. After meeting a kung fu master and learning the secrets of the Orient, Liddy wound up back on the East Coast. <laughs> he was briefly released due to, like, there's some court motions. I think this is evidence that Peter Maroulis is a pretty good lawyer. He basically gets him a few weeks out of prison to, like, be with his family based on a technicality. And, like, they know so getting weird. out this isn't going to last. Shit like yeah. this. This is the kind of stuff a, good, a really good lawyer can do for you, right? Right. Um, spring, so, spring break from prison. Yeah, you get you get a little <laughs> spring break from prison. <laughs> um, Holy then shit. he goes back in and he he serves another two years. He does fifty two months in total. On April twelfth, nineteen seventy seven, President Jimmy Carter, history's greatest monster, commutes his sentence from twenty years to eight. Quote: In the interests of justice. Now. This is a one of those moves that I never understood, right? When my when my knowledge of Woody and Watergate was a little more casual, I was like, what the fuck was Carter? Why would he do that? Like he's not an idiot. Why would he why would he pardon this very unbelievably guilty man? Hey guys, Robert here. I I, I misspeak. He the sentence was commuted, as I noted just a second ago. I use the word pardon here. That's incorrect. A commutation basically means that you're not questioning. Uh, whether or not they were guilty. They're still guilty. They're just uh, out of incarceration or whatever. This is significant in part because Liddy was not legally able to own firearms for the rest of his life, although he still kept owning guns. He just said they belonged to his wife. He shouldn't have been able to like use them, but people don't come after conservatives who get in trouble or hold them to any of the standards of their bail or whatever. But Carter, that always surprised me, right? Why Jimmy Carter? Why would he get this guy out of there? 
the White House spokesman said that the decision was made, quote, based on a comparison of Mr. Liddy's sentence with all of those others convicted in Watergate prosecutions. In other words, I think it was Carter's personal sense of fairness. I believe this is a bad call, but I get where he's coming from, right? Liddy, despite being an unrepentant fascist, is the most respectable of the White House people who go away because he doesn't lie or right. ob obfuscate. He's like, yeah, I'm guilty. Put me away. I will say nothing else. I'm not going to roll on anybody. And the fact that all of these guys who I think are kind of worse in a lot of ways, you know, right. Dean, maybe Dean is pretty consistent after Watergate of speaking out against the extremism for deck up to the present day. Right. He's a, he's a major figure of sort of being anti the the modern Republican yeah. Party. I think he might actually have eventually had kind of a real change due to his conscience. Possibly. I'm not certain of that. But uh, all these other guys, Ehrlichman and Magruder and fucking E. Howard Hunt, these people are fucking trash, Haldeman. Um, and the fact that Liddy does more time than them, I think it may have just kind of frustrated Carter because he was aware of that. And so he he weirdly thought it was unfair for Liddy to stay in. I don't think that's a good call, but I yeah. think that's from, from everything I've read. I think that's why Carter made it. It's the rest of the justice system is so fucked that yeah. those people didn't go away for longer. Yeah. I still and think thus, Carter perfectly fine to be critical of him for this choice, but I think that's why it was made. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Liddy gets paroled and his wife picks him up from jail. Uh, he had had plenty of time to think while in prison. And I think he had developed a pretty nuanced understanding that his future was in media. He's watching TV and stuff. He's getting letters from his family. All of these other Watergate guys are putting out books that are often bestsellers. Um, so he's aware, number one, probably I need to write a book about this. There's probably a lot of money in that. And number two, I can't work for a campaign anymore. I certainly can't be a lawyer anymore, but I can parlay my fame and my fame right. particularly for being this like hard headed, unbreakable soldier of the far right into a career. He understands as long as I stay consistent, this can keep me fed forever. Right. Right. And, you know, he is very famous. There's a crowd that gathers at the prison on the day of his release. And when he he does like a press conference, when his wife picks him up and reporters hurl questions at him, everyone wants to know where he's headed. Um, Liddy gives a cryptic answer to that one. He says, east of the sun and west of the moon. <laughs> now, anytime he says anything that he clearly didn't write, I'm like, got to know if that's some Nazi shit. It is not. Uh, this comes from a Norwegian folktale. I went ahead and yeah. read it just to be like, is there any like racist stuff in there? Um, not that I saw. Uh, it's, it's It seems to be an adaptation of an older Greek myth. One of the things I learned looking into this is that researchers, scientists or whatever who study folktales, I guess anthropologists, have a classification <laughs> system where they like group different kinds of folktales by their type. And this one qualifies as type ATU-425A, the search Ooh. for the lost husband or the animal as bridegroom. Uh, the <sighs> gist of, it's a little bit of a Beauty and the Beast kind of story. The gist of it is that there's this white bear that like comes to a poor family and is like, if you give me your, your daughter's hand in marriage, I'll make you rich. The bear is secretly like a cursed prince, right? Um, <laughs> and when she finds out, he's like, "Look, if if you, if as long as you if you don't follow these very specific rules, um, I'll be sent to live with an evil witch, and she lives east of the sun and west of the moon." Anyway, that's where the line comes from. Mm -hmm. Nothing Nazi uh, that I found in it, but it feels it feels <laughs> like, given the way his brain works, that was supposed to be some kind of code to mm -hmm. the true. The true, some, you know, some ones, and it just yeah. will never know. Whatever the fuck his train of thought was, impossible yeah. to know. He, he doesn't give a good explanation as to why he picked that one to reference. It, it is a pretty good cryptic sounding thing to say. I'll give him that. Um, uh, the other question he gets asked is how it feels to be out of prison. And Liddy replies in German, what does not kill me makes me stronger. And it is true that like <clears throat> Hitler, Liddy seems to mostly have benefited from his time behind bars um <laughs> this seems to work out a lot of times for fascists especially when you cut their sentence in half and don't just really yeah. put the screws to the fuckers um maybe a lesson for other folks the washington post sat down with his family right around then and they published an article that gives us some fascinating glimpses of their lives while gordon was away quote at the house in Oxon Hill, the color television was on yesterday and a sound tape recorder was nearby so the boys could capture any reports concerning their father's release. Two dogs relaxed on the living room couch. Outside, the family's 15 or 20 cats minded their own business. 
Just had to tell you that last bit there. <laughs> the ladies have 15 to 20 cats. That's too many oh cats. That's too, I love cats. That's too many cats. <laughs> that's so bizarre. That's a crazy amount of cats. Yeah. <laughs> um. Anyway, good to know, though. Interesting yeah. color on the family here. Yeah. So this piece reveals that the Liddies had purchased copies of every other Watergate memoir they could get their hands on. I think this is so that they can help their dad when he has to write his own memoir. Uh, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give him credit. I've read a number of Watergate memoirs. His is the best. Not in terms of its accuracy. None of them are trustworthy. But it's it's the most readable. You can't put it down. He is actually, this is one of the things he is actually good at. One of the only things that he's legitimately a skill with. He's a pretty good writer. Like he's he's <laughs> effective. He's not like an artistic writer. He's not like, he's not fucking, you know, Cormac McCarthy or whatever. But he <laughs> is he's extremely effective. He's very clear. He understands how to pace things. You're never bored, you know? It, you, you kind of, I read the whole book through cover to cover and I was at a pretty consistent level of interest the whole time. Um, partly because it's so crazy, but he doesn't get right. in his own way, right, with his right. prose. So I'll, I'll give him credit for that. He's not a bad writer. The most interesting thing that Washington Post piece uh, gives us as a snapshot is an understanding of how deep the Liddy family's Nixon derangement went. Quote, Jim and Tom Liddy said they had watched the end of the first episode of Washington Behind Closed Doors. They said they are not angry at Nixon for referring in the Frost interview to those involved in the Watergate operation as nuts. I don't blame him for anything. He's gone through so much, said Tom. Poor Dick Nixon, <laughs> the real victim of Watergate. <laughs> oh, just the mm-hmm. ultimate, the ultimate fascist sin. These people, yeah, it is, it is remarkable. I didn't know people could be that fascist, but by yeah. God. <laughs> now, the most important thing you get here is an understanding of what a nightmare this whole period behind bars is for Mrs. Liddy. Um, In addition to being the breadwinner, she has to raise their adolescent children alone. Quote, their mother, Tom Liddy said, is having it harder than we are, holding the place financially together, Jim said, finishing his brother's sentence. There were ups and downs, but she went through all of them. And the dimensions of the Liddy marriage have always been kind of confusing to me. They are together for 54 years. I have heard speculation that he cheated on her at one or more points. Um, it's common enough that I think there might be something to it, but I don't know. I haven't seen any evidence of it either. Certainly nothing that's like conclusive. Um, some of what he writes about her does seem to me to be borderline abusive. The clearest example of that comes right after his release when she picks him up from prison. Liddy saw what he claims as she's driving away from the prison, he sees four, he calls them four cream-colored Ford Granadas with New York license plates that identify them as press cars that start following him, tracking him as they're leaving the jail. Now, I looked into it. New York does issue special marked plates for for journalists. Um, You know, you have to be with a pretty big outlet to get them, but uh, that is a thing that they do. Liddy claims that he had Fran drive slowly at first so they could all get a shot of him and he hoped they would leave, but they keep following him. Fran tries to lose them, but Liddy writes, quote, she's just not cut out for that sort of thing. <laughs> so Liddy, the man, has to take charge and save them from these, <laughs> these journalist cars that are tracking them because obviously he's got the dr- FBI. Dr- We're going to talk in part two about his FBI driving oh, skills because yeah. we get a chance to test him when he's on Fear Factor <laughs> as a spoiler for where this whole episode ends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. We come to a Joe Rogan point at the end here, wow. handing off the fat. But anyway, so yeah. Liddy the man has to take charge. Pull over. What? You heard me. Pull over. We're putting in the first team. But you're not even insured. Don't argue with me, goddammit. Pull over. Oh God. So he takes over behind the wheel, but he can't lose the tail, right? It doesn't matter that he's taken over because he's no better at this than her. Yeah. And an honest observer might conclude from this that like, Maybe you don't actually know anything about losing a tail, G. Gordon Liddy. Maybe you have absolutely <laughs> no skills driving in this manner. Um, but he can't admit this. And he writes that he told his wife, I know they've got more cylinders and radios, but nobody stays with me when I don't want him to. There's something wrong here. I don't know. Oh I guess they do, God. G. Gordon. <laughs> his solution to this problem is to drive like even more of a maniac. He like does a, a 180 in the middle of like a busy street <laughs> and like spins around and shit. Um, this 
terrifies his wife. She has spent close to half a decade dealing with all of this unimaginable stress on his behalf. She picks him up, probably not entirely certain how the man that she married is going to be different after five year, almost five years of prison. And then he immediately goes insane on the highway, yeah. shouting about imaginary people following them. I Quote, mean, to her to her comfort, it's nice that he hasn't changed in prison. I, I guess, maybe. <laughs> Quote, it was a challenge I couldn't resist, and I took off, hitting over 70 miles per hour through city streets, going through red lights deliberately and taking turns at the limit of adhesion. By the time I got into Jersey, there were only two tails left, and Fran, scared at her wits, was crying uncontrollably. Oh my god. So he's his wife is just sobbing and he's like, "No, I did a good job. Only two guys are still following us." Yeah. Two out of four. <laughs> yeah. You know that radios and telephones tailed. exist. <laughs> you are still being tailed, G Gordon Liddy. Oh my um god. Liddy eventually claims he lost the tail. I don't think he really I don't I don't believe that at all. Um, maybe they lived in Jersey and we're glad like, <laughs> yeah, um, after an extremely long journey, which he, he says that his basically him failing to lose this tail and traumatizing his wife is a victory, a symbolic <laughs> victory of his his triumph over Judd Sirica, quote, and his allies in the press. And I love that he sees it that way because it's like. Man, the New York Times argued you should be released. The press are your <laughs> only real friends. Yeah. Like, Nixon threw you under the bus. The media held you up because they wanted to, like, make money writing stories about you. Your whole career came from the fact that the press were your allies. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. Um, Although that's classic. I mean, that playbook yeah. gets repeated oh, yeah, so much sure. more in, sure. the, in the people yeah. who he influenced. Yeah. Liddy is so overjoyed at his victory over this tale that he starts singing the lyrics from his favorite song, which comes from the play. <laughs> now, this this comes from I expected him to like sing. I don't know. My country tis of the he picks a song from the musical Cabaret, which he had. And it's a song that he modified, quote, to suit myself. The yeah. lyrics go, America, America, show us the sign your children have waited to see. The morning will come when the world is thine. Tomorrow belongs to thee. Now, that could be kind of innocuous, right? But <laughs> when I saw that line, especially the part about how he had reworked the lyrics of this song <laughs> to suit himself, I had to look into it a little deeper. The song he was singing that he had modified is called Tomorrow Belongs to Me, which could be fashy, and in fact is, because yeah. it's from a 1966, Cabaret's a 1966 musical, um, and the, it's written by two Jewish musicians, right, who are lampooning at the, at the fascist qualities that they see in American nationalism. The specific song, Tomorrow Belongs to Me, is sung by a Nazi in the play. It is specifically a Nazi song about his view of patriotism that Lee yeah. has modified and is kind of like, unironically singing because he is such a fucking fascist. Yeah. And in fact, he's not the only one to do this. Nazis love, this is an example of like kind of failed satire because yeah. Nazis love the song Tomorrow Belongs to Me. They love it so much that they have been adapting it for their own albums and pre-printing lines from it in their propaganda since the 1970s. The first use of the song by a white power band that we have documentation of was the year before Liddy published his autobiography Will, 1970. When British Nazi band Screwdriver does a cover of it. Screwdriver are like hardcore fucking fascist musicians. Yeah. Swedish Nazi singer Saga also records a cover of this song, which is cited by Norwegian mass shooter Anders Breivik as one of the things that inspired him to gun down like 70 children. Um, so, yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Love that G. Gordon Liddy singing this. I mean, so unsurprising, but yeah. Very, very. This might be the most direct Nazi thing that I've seen him do, right? And that's pretty impressive. That's pretty, and that he's done a lot. Um, Liddy claims at the end that after belting out this fascist anthem, his wife looks over at him with tears in her eyes and says, God, after all these years, you haven't changed at all. She yeah. blew her nose lustily, then sighed. I don't suppose you ever will. I grinned over at her. Bet your ass, kid. My oh, my God. God. Oh <laughs> How my does God. someone blow their nose lustily? That's, I, oh. that's a great question, Ian. Uh, I don't think they do, but 
Maybe snot perverts, right? Those have yeah, to be a thing. I mean, yeah. there's at least one. Yeah. Yeah. There's got to be. There, <laughs> there's, there's, there has to be a thriving online snot pervert community. There's definitely that, a subreddit that, for that. Like, that has a larger <laughs> GDP than Liechtenstein, right? The number of, <laughs> the amount of money and snot pervert stuff, you could, you could start your own city outside of Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, that's where we're going to close things out for today, because this is basically yeah. where his book ends. Don't worry. We have a lot more to say about G. Gordon Liddy, but this is kind of the end point of his his autobiography, Will. So, Andrew, you got anything to plug? Yeah. Um. Yeah, since the last episode, we triumphed over the fucking AMPTP asterisk. <laughs> You, you know, you sort beat of their asses. <laughs> yeah. Better, better than anyone ever thought labor fucking yeah. works. Yeah. Um, strike is over. I don't know. Um, I'm not going back to a writer's room, so I'm back to just the hustle. But mm-hmm. uh, I don't know. Still, still, yo, is this racist? Still uh, got premium shows. We did a little strike wrap up that um, I think people found informative. So I don't know. Check it out. Yeah. Hire, hire Andrew. Put him in a room. I know David S. Goyer always listens to the podcast, so you know, <laughs> bring him on. Well, uh, we still got, we still got, you know, if if we can just get someone to see the vision of Super Soaker Full of Piss, there's two options. A lot of irons in the fire. Yeah, a lot of irons thing. in the fire. I'm I'm pushing Goyer specifically because it's my dream that you'll get you'll get staffed on Foundation, and then I can parlay that into having lunch with Lee Pace, which is my life goal. <laughs> Um, Listen, <laughs> well, yeah, that my promise to you, I guess we'll do that. <laughs> yeah, there there we go. Um, just some in and out burger doesn't have to be anything fancy. You know, it can be fancy, Lee, if, if you want it to be. Yeah. Um, anyway, to you. <laughs> this has been uh, Behind the Bastards. If you want to listen to this show and all of our other shows free of ads, Cool Zone. What, what do we Cooler Zone. Zone. Cooler Zone. Thank you, Ian. Um, (laughs) Cooler Zone Media. Uh, Subscribe. It's not very much money and there's no ads. So if you're doing a road trip, if you have a long, if you have like a nine hour drive and you're like, you know, it'll get me and my family through this nine hour drive is learning a disastrous amount about G. Gordon Liddy. You can do that without ads, you know? Yeah, it's 50% cooler. So it's 50% cooler. All right, everybody go to hell. I love you. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com. Or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.